Thank you so much uh, for your kind introduction, Dr. PC. So uh, uh, let me share my um, screen. Okay, and then the magnify it. Uh, it is really my honor and pleasure to be invited by um, this platform and then to share with you um, ultrasound guided uh, spine intervention. Uh, so you can see the, the screen very clear, right? Yes. Yes, Doc. Okay. Okay. So I have nothing to disclose apart from being the author of the Muscle Skeletal Ultrasound app. And I like to um, continue my lecture with a case series. Our first case is, uh, uh, of course, this is not an introductory uh, lecture for uh, Muscle Skeletal Ultrasound Guided uh, Spine Intervention. I think this is also not for beginners. Uh, I like to invite uh, any one of you, if you really want to learn muscle skeletal ultrasound guided spine intervention, you, you can come to um, Asia, especially you can come to Hong Kong next year in end of June. And then we are going to have fresh cadaver workshops and then we're going to work on the silent teachers. And so our first case uh, is a 65-year-old lady with severe low back pain for two days after moving home with um, a lot of packing and unpacking. And then pain mainly over the lumbosacral region, soreness, stiffness in sensation, no radiation, could not stand straight easily after sitting. And the pain better during sleep for a while. Physical examination shows severe local tenderness over both iliac crest and some tenderness over the bilateral paraspinal muscles. Could not stand up straight, and uh, especially after prolonged sitting. A straightly raising test, bilateral 80 degrees, and neurological test for lower limbs, normal. Muscle skeletal test, um, normal for the pelvis as well. Uh, of course, this is not an examination um, lecture. I'm not, uh, I, I don't have time to, to elaborate uh, the physical science. So this is um, just uh, to reiterate uh, what will ultrasound see a lumbar spine, interspinous region, and then you have see the multivitide covering the uh, inferior and superior articular pillar, which is the facet joint and the medial branch uh, outside the mammillary process, and then with the QL, quadratus lumborum, attached to the transverse process, and the psoas deeper to that. And do remember that outside the multivita, you have the longissimus and the iliocostalis. And even outside the longissimus, you have the thoracolumbar fascia and then the subcutaneous fat. So uh, this is just a join. And then if you want to work on any uh, try to learn spine um, ultrasound or even palpation, try to get a, a lean model and try to palpate um, and then draw the landmarks and then try to, to learn the techniques. And this is how the patient end up uh, on the, during the treatment. So I treat the lower back over the iliac crest and then when I put the ultrasound down over the iliac crest, what I have seen is this blood vessel. This is the blood vessel going together with the superior clunial nerve over the iliac crest. And uh, the, the most medial one is seven centimeters from the spinous process. And the, leg, and the next one is uh, another inch from the most medial one. And the third one, another inch. So you're going to see three superior cluneal nerves over the iliac crest. And then with a patient with um, a superior cluneal nerve entrapment, especially after this uh, bending a lot and then to do the, um, the housework, and this is a very common. And then 
that's the reason why I put the dry needle over all those uh, superior cluneal nerves to treat the patient. If, and this is uh, how it looks like if I'm going to hydro dissect the superior cluneal nerve. You look at the uh, fibrosis tunnel, and then you try to hydro dissect the, the fibrosis tunnel and with the attachment of the lumbar fascia covering the fibrosis tunnel. And you're going to see your needle tip inside the tunnel. Then when you hydro dissect, you're going to see um, the fluid initially um, quite difficult to, to get through the, the fascia. And after you're getting through the fascia by hydro dissection, then you, you can see the free flow of the fluid all the way up and along that. This is, you are using a curved linear transducer, then you can do the, and um, you can see the, the blood vessel going together with superior cluneal nerve. Then you know that you are on the plane of that superior cluneal nerve and do the hydro dissection. So each time when you finish the hydro dissection, you should be able to see the flow of the, the blood vessel going together with a superior cluneal nerve increased. So that's the, the end point and the patient gets immediate relief with um, the low back pain. The patient can get up from the couch pretty much immediately and without any pain. If that is due to the um, superior cluneal nerve entrapment. And then remember the patient with normal pelvis and then with also quite normal neurological test and also the lumbar spine. So, and then, and then also severe tenderness over the, the, attack, uh, the fibrosis tunnel. So you do have to know how to palpate this fibrosis tunnel. The most sensitive way of doing it is by palpation. And after that, you put the transducer down. After the hydro dissection, you can see increasing flow of the blood vessel going together with the superior cluneal nerve. So this is, a, um, if you want to learn the more about superior cluneal nerve, you can get this textbook uh, from Robert Main. And I learned the muscle skeletal uh, skills first from um, his son, Jean Main. Stand. One to L3, and then also you have the subcostal nerve of the T12, and also the T11 intercostal nerve also going uh, to the iliac crest as well. So the next case is a 50-year-old medical doctor. He, she, him, uh, herself is a, a general practitioner with uh, a lot of sitting during work. She complained of low back pain for uh, a year and a half and refer pain to the right more than the left thigh and even to the toes. And when weather changed, there was uh, increasing pain and she could not sit, stand or walk prolonged and lying down on the couch, relieve a little bit of the pain and she failed uh, 30 sections of physiotherapy and exercise or hydrotherapy. And x-ray by referring, referring doctor showed minimally degenerated lumbar spine. And uh, physical examination showed um, FRS dysfunction of the lumbar facet and right worse than left. And the bilateral posterior mutation of the sacrum and slight right on left posterior sacral torsion. So this is how it looked like on ultrasound over the inferior SI joint. This is the sacrum and the spinous process of the sacrum and the inferior SI joint. And this is the ileum right here. And uh, this is uh, going to the superior SI joint. And you're going to see this is the multi multifidine muscle. And this is the uh, thoracolumbar fascia on top of it. So do pay attention to this uh, diseased uh, pattern, a uh, acogenic pattern of this patient. And this is go to the L5S1 facet. And remember, this is the facet and posterior longitudinal ligament, interspinous um, ligament, and the thoracolumbar fascia. And this is the uh, longissimus, and this is the multifidine, multifidine on the, the other side. And this is go to the L45 
and you see the um, osteophytic um, L5S1 on the right side facet joint. But remember this, the multifidi comparing to the, to the right, to the left side is more hyper echoic. So this is on the long longitudinal view. You can see this is the facet of the L34, L45, and L5S1. And this is the multifidi. And that's the th a logismus. And this is the thoracolumbar fascia on top of it. So we take a, take a look at the, the pattern of this um, multifidi and then comparing to the longissimus. You can notice that the patient with quite a derangement in the striated pattern of this um, um, multifidi muscle and also with increasing hyperechogenicity. And this is the right, the left side is not too bad, but the right side is much worse. And with also a very osteoarthritic uh, page, a pattern of this uh, L, L34 and L, um, L5S, L45 is not that bad, okay. So remember, this is the, the sacrum of um, another uh, normal individual, and that this is mine, as a lower SI joint, you can see them. The, the, this is the uh, this is my multifidi. That's my glute max, and this is the superior uh, about inferior SI joint. You can see this is the multifidi multifidi on either side, and this is go to the, the superior SI joint. You pay attention to the pattern, to the echogenic pattern of the of this of my multifidi with that patient. It's very different, and. For this patient, what I did is I did a uh, autologous platelet-rich plasma injection. Platelet uh, is a leukocyte-rich plasma injection to the uh, fatty atrophic lumbar multifidi muscle. This is uh, when you when when I do the injection, try to pay attention to the twitching of the multifidi one twitch, and you can see another twitch. There should be third twitch very soon. The third twitch, fourth twitch. The twitching re is response. In fact, is oh the fifth twitch, and you can see the when I'm injecting into the striated pattern of this multifidi. In fact, I the resistance is very small, and this is a in fact it's a fatty atrophic multifidi pattern. And I can go even deeper and then to the facet joint and then do my injection. And I can even go to the facet between the superior articular pillar and the inferior articular pillar. So I do a bit even more over the sacrum and over the SI joint and I try to do this as, uh, uh, to the superior, uh, posterior dorsal sacral iliac ligament and even lower down and then to the multivitae all the way inserting to the sacrum, the most inferior part of the sacrum. So that's for the multivitae injection, the main target. After the injection, when the patient get up from the, from the, from the couch, she felt a lot more, a lot better with um, the lower limb referring pattern. And there is, uh, she felt it's very much like uh, wearing uh, a very strong uh, lumbar brace. Very good, very good feeling. And the pain is almost immediate relief with, uh, because I, I mix a little bit of uh, local anesthetic into that. Our, the, the third case is a 45 year old lady, a manager sitting um, the sedentary lifestyle during work and low back pain for a year and a half, left more than right, occasionally referred to thigh, and could not sit, stand, walk, prolong, lying down, relieving the pain a bit, um, but prolonged sleeping trigger the pain in, in the morning. And she felt, um, she felt 225 sessions of physiotherapy, exercise, and hydrotherapy. X-ray, again, showed minimally degenerated lumbar spine, and with the bilateral F FRS dysfunction of the lumbar facet, left worse than right, 
and left on right posterior sacral torsion. I don't have time to explain the term, but I like to go to treat this FRS dysfunction and together with a left on right posterior sacral torsion. And this is uh, very much the referring, referring pattern of the patient, very much like this referring path, referring down from the, uh, pretty, uh, like uh, from the SI joint all the way down. And this is how you look like when you try to ask the patient to bend forward. Remember you are opening the facet. When you're bending backward, you're closing the facet. And with a FRS dysfunction means the facet state in flexion. And when I ask the patient to bend forward, I can see debris inside the, between the superior articular pillar and the inferior articular pillar and a bit of the fluid. And if we are not treating the patient well, later on the patient will develop facet cyst and eventually developed osteophytes and the patient could not uh, close the facet anymore because of the osteophytes. And also remember when you want to see, try to pay attention to the multifidi, which is which are the, the muscle covering the facet, a lot of time you're going to see the derange, derangement in the striator pattern of the multifidi. Turn the transducer 90 degree this time. You see the left side is worse than the right side. You can see this, the hyper echoic echoic um, debris-like um, degenerated uh, soft tissue inside between the inferior articular pillar and the superior articular pillar. So that's the um, dysfunction facet. To prove it, I can put a dry needle to the facet and try to elicit patient's pain. Um, so both from the L45, we put a dry needle between the superior articular pillar and the inferior articular pillar. And remember, I do not put the, the dry needle to the medial branch between, outside the mammillary process because you put the dry needle there, you probably can reproduce the same pain. But the patient, the problem is not from the medial branch, it's from the, from the facet. That's why I deliberately put the dry needle between the superior articular pillar and the inferior articular pillar. In, that means the intraarticular or at least intracapsular. And treatment. If we do not have a very tall superior articular pillar, you can come from lateral to medial. This is also the technique I, uh, we teach in uh, the World Institute of Pain. You can go to the medial branch, you can hydro dissect the medial branch outside the mammillary process underneath uh, the ligament cover the uh, medial branch. Then you go to the facet because you have already proven the facet is causing patient's pain. Then you, after hydro dissecting the medial branch, then you do the intracapsular injection between the superior articular pillar and the inferior articular pillar, the patient will not feel that much. And it's, let, it's much less painful injection. You can, your needle can go all the way to the spinous process. But if you're facing a patient with a very tall superior articular pillar, that means your lateral to medial approach, even you go to the intracapsular, you probably cannot treat the intra-articular part of the facet. That's why I have the needle coming from caudal to cranial. And I have to go in plane first when the needle is, and I also treat the multifidi and then go to the, between the, intra, uh, between the superior articular and the inferior articular pillar and turn the transducer 90 degree to prove that uh, your needle is intra-articular. Then you put your, uh, in this case, we are treating with uh, platelet-rich plasma. And to treat the SI joint, we also use the in-plane technique. And I, I would like to use bevel up because I would like to have the, the, the uh, anterior part of the ileum to guide the needle to go intra-articular. After treating the intra-articular, 
the synovial plot of the joint. I will also like to treat the um, posterior uh, sacroiliac ligament. And also I would like to treat the iliolumbar ligament because this is in fact the culprit. This covering the, the uh, superior, uh, uh, I mean the uh, anterior sac uh, sacroiliac ligament and then also, also blending together with the insertion of the quadratus lumborum and also the intertransversarii ligament and muscles. So I, I call this is the lumbosacroiliac complex and then for the stability of the sacroiliac joint and the lumbosacral spine. That's why you need to go to treat the ilolumbar ligament, but I like to warn you that there is a spinal artery going together right outside um, the ilolumbar ligament. And I use in-plane technique, and then you have to use pepper pot technique as well, and then treat multiple uh, part of the uh, uh, iliolumbar ligament. So our case four is a 70 year old lady, housewife, mainly doing housework, low back pain on and off for 10 years, mainly a uh, lumbosacral region. And uh, occasionally refer to lower limbs and down to toes, could not sit, uh, stand, walk, prolong, lying down, relieve the pain, walk, uh, not waking up by the pain, but recently complained spinal claudication and relieved by flexion of the back and squatting. So she failed uh, six months of physiotherapy, exercise, and hydrotherapy. The referring doctor showed moderate to severe degeneration and spinal stenosis. And she has bilateral ERS and FRS dysfunction of the lumbar facet. It's very osteoarthritic. And the bilateral anterior pelvic tilt the straight leg racing normal, neurological attacks, bilateral hyperreflexia from L5, L4 to S1, otherwise normal. So this is in fact the referring pattern of the patient bilaterally. And what we did is uh, we did a caudal injection of 5% dextrose and for this chronic low back pain. And we would like to put the needle underneath the sacral coccygeal ligament and outside the phylum terminale. So this, the end point should be the epidural space. Oops. So the needle goes in plane and hydrodissect. And after going, getting through this uh, thoracolumbar fascia and a little bit of this, the, the end point of the uh, multivitae, you hydrodissect this sacroiliac ligament and outside the phylum terminale, I would like to see the pushing down of the phylum terminale. And when I do the injection in this, uh, the caudal, I would like to put another transducer over the L45 on either or either some uh, L5S1 interlaminar space. Let's do that again. I like to put the transducer, another one, over the L5S1 or L45, and to see the flow of the fluid when I'm injecting this decaudal space, and then I would like to see the flow all the way up to the interlaminar space for the success. So, and then uh, after that injection, the patient got a very good relief. Uh, the case five is a 55 year old lady, a lawyer with a whiplash injury two years ago, Develop, developed vertigo, headache, brain fog, difficulty to focus and poor eyesight. See ophthalmologist and told eyes are within normal range. No causes found, CENT, no causes found for the vertical. And bring MRI and MRA, uh, bring all the way down to neck normal. And physical examination, the suboccipital proprioceptive relieving test positive. I don't have time to, to elicit, to, uh, to elaborate. And the relieving the vertical, the visual acuity, and then also other neurological tests normal. She got tenderness over bilateral, uh, uh, the greater occipital nerve, lesser occipital nerve, and the third occipital nerve distribution, and then also including a bit of the sub-occipital nerve. 
and that's how it look like. This is the home position when I this um, uh, turn the transducer a bit, and you can see the greater occipital nerve, and this is the inferior oblique. This is the uh, uh, rectus capitis posterior major, and that's um, the spinal cord is down there, and we have the uh, intrathecal space right here. And this is um, already the occiput. So you, you can see I turn the transducer all the way and then showing the long axis of the greater occipital nerve. And you can see the greater occipital nerve wrapping around the inferior oblique from the C2 nerve root dorsal rami and going to cover passing underneath the sem semispinalis capitis and are going to pass through the semispinalis capitis and the upper trapezius to surface to the skin. And also it uh, covers the rectus capitis posterior major as well. So this is uh, how it look like. So the dura, the uh, spinal cord, and, um, and that's the long axis of the greater occipital nerve. And the entrapment point is right here underneath uh, when the greater occipital nerve passing through the semispinalis capitis. And it's usually it's not um, by the uh, inferior oblique. So when I try to um, go one more time from the short axis of the great, uh, greater occipital nerve to the long axis of the greater occipital nerve, and you, you can see um, the, uh, the vertebral arteries on the, the laterals. And then you can see that's the going all the way. In fact, if I go from the fascial plane of the greater occipital nerve down to C2, 3 facet, you're going to see the third occipital nerve. This is the third occipital nerve one more time. And remember, it's from the C2 when you go down to the, um, the C2 three facet, you're going to see the third occipital nerve. And remember, the third occipital nerve got the contribution from C2 and C3 um, nerve root. When you see the C2 three facet, and that's the, the part that when you, you're going to find the third occipital nerve. And so to hydrodissect the greater occipital nerve, remember it is entrapped when it's passing through the semispinalis capitis. That's why you have to hydrodissect from cranial to caudal. That means is from from the um, when the when the greater occipital nerve trying to pass through um, the semispinalis capitis. Once again, I would like to warn that this is really not a procedure for beginners. And most of the time I can even go down. In short, so I would, uh, after the third occipital nerve, I probably would not keep going uh, to talk about the suboccipital structure. So when you hydro dissect, the third occipital nerve, remember, it is also injecting the C2-3 facet. And you have to be very careful with the deep occipital, uh, deep cervical uh, artery. And also the uh, on the lateral side, you see the vertebral artery. So you, you have to, to be very careful about these two arteries. And also remember the spinal cord also get some of the uh, anastomosis from the deep cervical artery. So I want you not to have, uh, in, not to inject the deep cervical artery. And then this is the C2-3 facet, this is C2 body, and that's a C1 that's, that's, that's over, over, over the other side. Okay, time is uh, running short. So I will not, I will skip this, uh, this uh, suboccipital nerve and then skip the C2-3 facet injection. That's the same as C as third occipital nerve. I will skip the C1 nerve root and also the C01 uh, posterior joint and skip that, skip that, skip that. 
and also the C1, C01 joint on the lateral approach is too advanced. So just forget it. C12 joint also forget it. And uh, posterior and lateral approach forget it. And also remember, in fact, when you try to study regenerative injection therapy, injecting the suboccipital part of the, the uh, of the spine, in fact, this is a, uh, which is in fact has been elaborated by many, many uh, ancestors of the prolotherapy specialists. And also you have to pay attention that the semispinalis capitis insertion is from the um, superior uh, nuchal line, just underneath the superior nuchal line. But, re but remember its, ori its origin is from the transverse process all the way down to T6. That's why after treating the suboccipital structure, I will also like to treat the costal transverse joint and also all the way going down a bit to the um, transverse process. And, and sometimes you, you even have to treat a bit of the ribs. Okay, the patient got very good relief for about uh, a year and a half, but later on developed high pitch uh, tinnitus for five months and then come back to see us. And she failed to with all the treatments from the ENT surgeons. And what we did at that time was we found the intrathecal space, which is underneath the inferior oblique. Then we tried to do a uh, injection right into the intrathecal space here. Okay, injection is, we tried to inject in plane and remember your your great uh, third occipital nerve is in is right next to the spinous process at that level and your greater occipital nerve is uh, lateral to the needle and our needle try to hydro dissect the inferior oblique muscle and after hydro dissect the inferior oblique muscle and then you get to the maldural bridge when you get to the myodural bridge, then you have to, to push. I don't want to damage the spinal cord or the spinal artery down there. And then when you, when you push, then you inject. Immediately, the patient got uh, aggravating of the tinnitus, then later on get a very good relief. And what we're putting here is... Um, just dextrose. And the patient, in fact, got a very good relief after the, um, the dextrose injection to the intrathecal space. But this is too dangerous, and I will just skip. Okay. Uh, I will finish within five minutes. Okay. So the, um, our next patient is a 38-year-old nurse low back pain on and off for one week after trip and sprained lower back and the mainly the lumbosacral region and refer to um, the right lower limbs down to toes. And also uh, uh, the X-ray and MRI show moderate degeneration and with desiccated L4-5 and L5-S1 um, disc. And uh, really racing normal, Neurological test normal, except it's a, also a three plus reflex, hyperreflexia over the L4 to S1. And this, the referring, the referring pattern is like this, um, the blue one here. And that's a typical for L4-5 set, L4-5 disc. And remember the disc is innovator in the front from the um, sympathetic nerve and from the back, is find from the sinew of a tubal nerve. And this is how she walk. She felt pain. And quite an awkward gait. 
she couldn't walk after she felt the pain. So that's the, the severe pain that suddenly stopped the patient from walking. Like, and then the pain is radiating down from all the way down to the, to the left toes. And once again, if you join our Fresh Cadaver Workshop next year, we are going to show you how to learn and uh, all the, the sonar anatomy of the lumbar spine muscle layer by layer on when a patient is lying lateral. And then uh, I don't have time to go through that. So we have, we have two approach with the one approach uh, with a patient lying Uh, hydro dissect the lumbar nerve root to the selective nerve root block, or for the time's sake, I just quick. You have to really to hydro dissect and then to prevent damaging the uh, spinal artery. And I really like to have the patient lying a lateral deep cubitus and then to do the injection to the intradiscal space and to inject. And in fact, the needle inside, uh, just passing through the annular fibrosis, the patient got a quick reproduction of the patient's usual pain and after the injection of the K-leverage plasma, the patient got immediate, immediate relief of all the pain shooting down um, the leg. So the last patient is a dentist with a whiplash injury during traffic accident, neck pain and radiculopathy with a bilateral upper limbs, and then neurological test bilateral hyperreflexia of upper limbs. And this is uh, how it looked like. So the, the, it's very bad. You can see this, this is osteoarthritic um, anterior longitudinal ligament. And also with the desiccation in the, with the debris inside the disc, intervertebral disc. In fact, this is a C5, 6, this is C6, 7. And that's a C7, T1 is quite normal. You can see this, uh, this is osteophile, osteophile. That's normal. And that's the disc, disc, and the four five. This is uh, the picture from his identical twin. He has an identical twin and then uh, coming together with him. And then this is the, exactly the, the C, um, C67, C56, C45, and on the side. Uh, again, we want to have um, the patient. Uh, on the supine position, this is, a, this is the disc. And we try to hydro dissect passing through the SEM, the omohyoid muscle, and then the underneath the internal jugular vein and also the, um, the carotid artery between the uh, nerve root, outside the uh, medial to the nerve root. And uh, we hydro dissect the stellar ganglion and then sympathetic trunk, I meant and then all the way to the, um, to the uh, annular fibrosis. And then we do the intradiscal injection. Uh, before we do that, we push with um, uh, PLP um, mixed together with uh, local anesthetic. We just use pure PLP without local anesthetic. And we reproduce patient's concordant pain. And after that, and then we change the syringe and then mixed um, um, a little bit of local anesthetic and then to take away the pain. And then this is the sympathetic trunk. And after passing through the longest coli, then we go to the joint. And then we validate if the patient is having a difficulty and we're going to validate with a fluoroscope and then, to, uh, and then injecting a bit of dye. And very soon you're going to see another approach uh, to another article to be published very soon. Then you are going to have the needle passing through, hydro dissecting 
the thyroid and also the carotid artery and then to go to the disc and this is an another easier approach to get to the nucleus of bosses. So to summarize, MSK ultrasound can be used to um, in a spinal condition to make diagnosis and to make guided injection and also to for the rehabilitation and review. I don't have time to cover today. Uh, once again, if you get this um, uh, apps. And I want you to write me email about the feedback. And then uh, we're updating the, the apps um, bit by bit. And I want to see you in Hong Kong next year in the, the last week of June for the Fresh Cadaver Workshop. Thank you very much for your attention.